Can I? Dr. Clive Swanson did his postdoctoral uh, pre-doctoral training at Harvard University. He then received his PhD from the University of Cambridge in England, where he subsequently became a welcome fellow and established a laboratory focused on, focusing on stem cell research. He then moved to the University of Wisconsin in 2000 as a professor of neurology and anatomy and founded their stem cell and regenerative medicine center. In 2010, he moved to Los Angeles and founded the Cedar sinai Board of Governors Regenerative Medicine Institute, which currently has 23 faculty members and over 120 staff. Main focus of the Institute is to both model and treat various human diseases with the use of induced pluripotent stem cells. At the heart of the RMI is the Cedar sinai Biomanufacturing Center, which manufactures iPSCs and other cell types for research purposes and clinical trials. Dr. Swanson received many recognitions for his work, including a recent feature on the front cover of National Geographic as the feature of medicine. Finally, Dr. Swanson has a long-standing interest in ALS, and he was sponsor of the first ever clinical trial delivering stem cells and a growth factor, GDNF, to patients that was recently completed at Cedar sinai The floor is yours, sir. All right, thanks so much. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Um, nice to be here virtually. Uh, just around the corner, if you ever want to come and visit uh, my disclosures, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about organ chip systems today. And we are an investor in Emulate, uh, and that's the system I'm going to be discussing. So very straightforward. Um, I'm really focusing this talk on technologies that might be interesting to the Terasaki Institute, that is sort of precision health, uh, IPS technology, um, along with uh, organ chip technology. Uh, I'm the last portion of the talk is going to be COVID, just because, as everybody else, we, we were tipped into COVID and uh, doing research in that in that space uh, about a year and a half ago. And actually, it's been quite exciting. It's taken us in some directions we weren't expecting. Let's start with an overview, just to let you know, the uh, the Regenerative Medicine Institute at Cedar Sinai is uh, quite broad now after ten years. Uh, we have various programs focusing in different area, disease areas, the brain, eye, blood, heart, gut, skeletal. Um, and I think <clears throat> what's fun is the integration that we have, horizontal integration between the different stem cell areas, which there's a lot of common features in stem cells and different tissues. And as I'll bring up in, this, in the talk, it's kind of nice that you can interact with the gut guys when you're working in the brain, uh, as I'll give an example of. So we have quite a broad uh, faculty and this is the biomanufacturing center that we just mentioned. And this is important if you want to do any clinical trials locally. We are the, one of the only CGFP centers in, in central LA. There's the city of Hope, of course, that has a, a GMP facility for cell production as well. Uh, and UCLA is building one out currently. Um, but really, I just want to highlight this new, new building. It's the north campus of Cedars. It's just north of the main hospital. Um, but it's a, a very large uh, footprint, 30, 40,000 square feet, which has uh, this core purple area for IPS production. And we're making IPS cells at scale. We have a project making a thousand IPS lines from patients with ALS. Won't talk about today. We also have this biomanufacturing center, which is fully CGMP compliant, <clears throat> along with the vector gene viral vector core, which will be also CGMP compliant. And that's being completed next year. So if you need any manufacturing done for stem cells, let us know. The IPS cell technology, I think, has uh, just been remarkable in how it's been adapted worldwide. Uh, it's a way that we can actually model human diseases in the petri dish, uh, and it's just led to an enormous amount of interest uh, over the last 10 years since uh, Shinya Yamanaka, kind of simultaneously with Jamie Thompson, discovered these things. And uh, what's remarkable to me is how reproducible across labs it's been. Driven by OCT4, OCT4. So if you express OCT4 in any adult cell, it takes it back in time to a pluripotent state. It, for all intents and purposes, looks like an embryonic stem cell that we spent so many years fighting with the NIH over because they have to be derived from embryos. And you can make any tissue of the human body. Uh, all of these tissues here we make at the Regenerative Medicine Institute. Uh, one that's not on there is fallopian tubes. We have a paper just coming out very shortly on actually making fallopian tubes from female iPS cells. We were doing that to model BRCA uh, in, in cancer. So you can model cancer in these models. You can model uh, neurogender diseases and many other disease uh, phenotypes. 
in the system. And of course, you could also, uh, this is kind of the modeling part, you can also use these cells as an autologous source of therapy for patients uh, if you get really good at making the tissues. The challenges are all about how mature the cells are, how functional they are, because really they're like an embryonic state, they're not adult. So that's kind of the, the caveat to a lot of what you'll hear today is we're looking at very young tissues. I think that's where organ chip technology comes in because it helps to advance the age of the tissue. Now, of course, <clears throat> this totipotent state is very exciting. Um, and what happens during development, this is an old Waddington slide, is this totipotent slate you think of up here, and then the cells sort of go down into the differentiated state. So this may be a fibroblast, this may be a neural tissue, this could be a kidney, and they're kind of traditionally being thought of as, you know, coming to an end stage. You differentiate, you sit there, and that's it. And of course, we found now what IPS tells us is you can go back in time, and that you can actually take differentiated cells back up to the top. So we, we kind of made an adaption of this uh, model. Uh, we kind of put it as a fun review uh, to Nature Biotech about 10 years ago, but they remarkably accepted it. Um, but then we grew on it, and actually it's quite a nice model of a pinball machine. And I think of IPS like this, where this is fertilization. This, If you wanted to have an embryonic stem cell, you have to fertilize the egg and the uh, sperm uh, modeled here with the a knob here that you pull to fertilize. And then as uh, the cell during development becomes pluripotent, it's the highest power, basically, at the top of that mountain. And then it goes, falls down through um, in these different lineages as you differentiate. And I put sort of the flippers here, OP4 and SOX2, which is a reprogramming, but we never thought you'd be able to do this, but you can. You can reprogram right back up to pluripotency. And just to add to that, what's happened over the last 10 years is this epigenetic phenotype of these cells is quite remarkable. Any cell in the body, it turns out, for instance, in the pancreas, the work of Doug Melton and others, you can actually take an exocrine cell and make it endocrine by simply applying three transcription factors. This is what we call direct reprogramming. So not only can you reprogram to pluripotency, you can reprogram within cell lineages and across cell lineages, depending on transcription factors. Now, how perfect are the cells when you reprogram is a big question for the field, and, and how much abnormality is caused when you reprogram with OX4, and are they as good as embryonic stem cells? I'd say that most of the data is pointing to the fact that they're very similar, uh, which again is more remarkable than not remarkable, given how sort of artificial these systems are in a sense. Um, and so this model is actually holding pretty pretty well that these cells, and that actually all cells in the body are in different states of differentiation can actually go back or sideways. So that's kind of my broad overview of IPS cells. Now I'm going to dive into part of the talk that deals with the disease. We're very disease centric at the hospital at Cedar sinai uh, We do a load of basic science, which is usually driven by a disease of some sort. And the first one I'm gonna talk about <coughs> um, is Lou Gehrig's disease or motor neuron disease. Now this is the one you don't wanna be diagnosed with. There are no uh, drugs uh, that treat this disease. Uh, about 10% are familial of ALS uh, and, and the rest is what we call sporadic. Uh, where the, the cause is unknown. Now we do know pathologically what happens, these motor neurons here in the upper motor neurons and the lower ones in the spinal cord die off, so you get paralysis, so you can't move. It's a very straightforward um, progression of uh, within about three years, you get a muscle twitching and then you get weakness and then you get flaccid muscle weight that there's absolutely no movement. Uh, it's a horrific disease. We don't know what causes it, but the question is, could we model? Uh, there's no real good animal models of sporadic ALS. Um, and so we approach this um, for uh, this work. And I'm just gonna highlight the group here that have done a lot of what I'm gonna show you now. Really started with a postdoc, Sam Sanchez in my lab, uh, who, who spawned a couple of NIH grants with the NCATS consortium uh, to convert these cells onto chips. Uh, and then the, uh, the big group here that uh, is currently working on this uh, on the right and these past people who left the lab since uh, starting this work on the left. Um, so it's been a great team. Um, and we started really, Sam and I started this by asking, you know, what's the best way to get motor neurons, which are the neurons that die in ALS from IPS cells? And what you do when you're modeling is you look at in vivo, and this is a review 
uh, we did some time ago with all the leaders in the field actually it's a nice uh, full review paper of how you make motor neurons because that was one of our starting questions and basically you mimic what happens in real development in the petri dish and so we take the cells through a series of steps in order to get motor neurons out <clears throat> and this is a picture of the motor neurons in green same with SMI 32 and red is islet one which is a nuclear marker of motor neurons remarkably similar to how they look <clears throat> in the human spinal cord so quite quite a nice model this is predicated um, this work uh, on a previous uh, uh, study that we did in one of the very first modeling papers and back then you could have one line and one disease patient and get a nature article this is very in 2009 uh, where we started and ALS uh, is horrific adult disease and spinal muscular atrophy is the uh, baby version of that where you're born with this mutation and uh, you lose motor neurons and basically babies will uh, not survive more than a couple of years normally uh, without drug treatment there are, there are now some drugs based on actually some of this technology and early on we said well in spinal muscular atrophy you can make ips cells and then make them into motor neurons like i just showed you that technique and what happens to the motor neurons and in this case early onset spinal muscular atrophy, the motor neurons actually died in the dish, uh, just like they did in the patient. And we saw this cell death model, uh, we could reverse it with some drugs, and that was all very exciting, and led to a number of different uh, modeling consortiums, uh, the way these projects quite often work for Huntington's disease, and for some rarer diseases, uh, like uh, MCT8 deficiency. So we really proved that we could model, uh, and then if we think about ALS, the genetic form of ALS, the most uh, there's the most common form, about 7% of patients carry this mutation. It's a repeat mutation, um, and it's a number of repeats in the C9-off gene. And if you have these repeats, you will get ALS. And so we took patients with those repeats. This is with Bob Baylor uh, when he was uh, here. Um, and then simultaneously, two papers came out, one um, in, uh, in Neuron and ours in Science Translational Medicine, showing that you can make IPS cells from patients with C9 ALS, and uh, they made motor neurons in the dish, but uh, unlike SMA that I showed you, the early onset disease, they didn't die. Um, we actually saw early events, uh, inclusion bodies and some um, accumulation of protein that would suggest that they had the mutation, but not avert cell death. That's gonna be later on, but we did use them to provide models for drug treatment. So giving antisense oligonucleotides, oligonucleotides, we could reverse some of the pathology we saw in this model. But this is all 2D and uh, two-dimensional is fine, but it's really not, wasn't giving us the richness of phenotypes that we were expecting or hoped to have. And that really led us to thinking about how we can better model uh, the disease. And this brings up the chip part of the talk. Um, this came about when I, actually first got introduced to CHIPS <clears throat> when I was asked to go to an NIH meeting where there was a consortium of CHIP users um, and present some data on IPS cells because nobody was using IPS. Everybody was using cell lines, but not IPS and CHIPS. This is about nine years ago, it's eight years ago probably. And so I went to the meeting, gave a talk, and I met uh, Don Ingber. And Don Ingber was, uh, had a company, uh, well, had a has a uh, center in Boston, part of Harvard, called the Wiss Institute. And I sat next to him, we got a coffee, we started talking and uh, we started collaborating. And actually it was great because uh, he educated me on chips and uh, the technology that, this, that, that he'd been using. And they were spinning out a new company at that time called Emulate. And he said, uh, you know, it'd be good to work with Emulate. And that's really where our collaboration started. Now Emulate <clears throat> make a PDMS chip, um, that is pretty standard by, you know, you guys make very advanced chips. This is a very basic chip. Uh, the nice thing is it's very reproducible. They've got a system which uh, manages to manufacture these at scale and very reliably. PDMS membrane with the seven micron pores. This is a lung chip. So they're now putting lung cells on the top and capillary cells on the bottom, endothelial cells. And in this uh, particular lung chip, quite nice, you can run a vacuum and you can actually stretch. So you can make the chip breathe. And then of course, uh, with the lung chip model, and I'll come back to this, we've been using this recently for COVID, uh, with the lung chip model, you can put air on the top, you can put blood through the bottom. And this gives you a lot of power. This gives you physiology. Um, it gives you ability to put flow. 
and, and kind of lets you do a lot of cool stuff. And what the Wits Institute was doing back then in Don's lab uh, was putting white blood cells um, through the bottom channel, blood essentially, and then putting an infection on the top channel and mimicking lung infection and showing that these macrophages could migrate from the blood through these little holes in the PDMS and interact with the top surface. And this is the real life uh, GFP labeled monocytes flowing through the chip, uh, a video. And what you'll see is uh, as you stimulate the top of the chip with TNF alpha and make it, it stimulate an infection, uh, the cells stop, they stick to the bottom of the chip. You're looking at from the bottom here. So they stick and then remarkably, they'll crawl out through the uh, seven micron holes of the PDMS as shown in this guy. He's migrating now up to the top. Once they get to the top, they can interact with the cells that are being infected. In this case, bacterial infection and the monocytes eat up the bacteria. So it's just a quick video showing you the system. Since we started collaborating with them, and again, see, this is a, an investor in the company. This is the technology. Uh, it now has this, uh, an orb. This provides the uh, air pressure for the system. This is called the Zoe, which, in which you put your chips. Uh, and they have these pod systems where you uh, put your fluids. So it's pretty much uh, it's completely um, devoid of uh, any um, wires or strings uh, cables, sorry, and tubing. And so uh, these cassettes here where your chip goes and then on top of the pods and the pods hold your media, inlet and outlet media. Um, and I thought I had another picture of this, but actually it's too up. Let me just go forward one. My slides got a bit mixed up here. Um, so here you have a picture of the pod design. Here's the chip, the microfluid chip goes in a little cassette, sits in here and then the uh, pod that it goes in has the inlet and outlet reservoirs for the two channels. And so you can collect and, and put your uh, media in to feed your chip. Now, no wires, it's all to do with vacuum and it pushes pressure on the top and forces the fluids through. So we started this uh, collaboration. Um, none of this was available. We did it all manually, but now it's all automated, which is nice. So here's the first study I'll show you. We uh, were trying to make this uh, ALS on a chip. The first thing really is actually to make the motor neurons. I told you how we make those. So we made the motor neuron progenitors from the IPS. And then what's nice with IPS is you can do these isogenic systems. So then we made isogenic cells. In the same IPS line, we made the MEC progenitors. So actually it's a method that Eric Schuster and I developed way back in Wisconsin when I was there. Um, and we were providing astrocytes to Eric who was doing this uh, uh, BMEC pr uh, production from IPS. So both of these uh, can now be brought together. Endothelial cells, the BMECs, the brain microvascular endothelial cells, line the brain uh, in the chip platform. And so uh, here's a, a video of a chip. And on the bottom there, you can see the endothelial channel coming in and the neural channel on the top. And here where they're mixed together, both neural and endothelial channel. Um, and I think it's going to zoom in in a moment. In green here are motor neurons with SMI32. And in red, as we, as we zoom into the chip and through the other side, are the endothelial channel. And you can see the beautiful uh, stratified epithelial cells that make up the bottom. And now this, this will, in three dimensions, actually wrap around the uh, chip. So you've created, essentially, on the bottom channel, an entire vascular unit. The blood, that's the, the uh, if you like, it's a, it's a large vessel um, and the endothelial cells, the BMECs are wrapped around. So they form a pretty tight barrier. Um, and we've done a lot of work to show that this blood-brain barrier is preserved. So now we essentially have uh, what we call the spinal cord chip. Um, and uh, that was published some time ago. And so if you want to go see the details, uh, please uh, go see this paper. At the same time, we were interested in uh, the blood-brain barrier, <clears throat> and together with um, Ricardo Arelli, who was at Emulate at the time, but spent a year in my lab, and Gad Fatin, who was a postdoc in my lab then, and Michael Workman, who's with me now still. Um, we did a nice uh, full series of experiments to show that the blood-brain barrier is quite well modeled in these systems. So not only do you get the brain or the spinal cord, you get the uh, blood-brain barrier as well. And that's led to a whole load of downstream collaborations and projects um, with this technology. And yes, you can flow real blood through these chips. We've taken patient blood 
uh, put it on the blood side. And then when you have, <coughs> uh, here's just three uh, examples. So this is with uh, BMECs um, and uh, neural tissue on the top channel and no TNF alpha, which would disrupt the blood brain barrier. And you can see the red channel, the blood here is pouring through this channel. It's not getting, it's not leaking into the other channels. You see it's, there's nothing in the other channel above it. Now, when you then give TNF alpha to the chip, you actually cause blood brain barrier leakage and, and you now get blood coming across into the uh, neural channel. And it causes the death of the neurons. So you can actually mimic a hemorrhage uh, using this technology. So quite exciting. A little tricky flowing blood through. You have to use heparin and a few other tricks, but um, definitely can. So this adds, this now brings up uh, this interesting inflammation system. You can, like we showed in the video, put immune cells through the bottom channel and see how they interact with the top channel. We were actually interested in bigger questions of if we have this spinal cord chip and we have the ALS samples, uh, is there a difference between ALS and control? And when we started these studies, we thought, oh, we just throw it in the chip. We'll get nice data out. But it turns out that the flow rate is quite important. Um, so when we use static chips, they can do so well. When we induce flow, um, we got nice uh, increases in the thickness of the section. So that now this is a cross section of a chip. This is the endothelial side. And without flow, you can see the neural layer is very thin, very narrow. It's almost like a 2D culture. But when we put flow in, we get a nice uh, proliferation event going on here. You get more of a dense culture and much more physiology going on. And we can maintain these cultures uh, for 28 days. Uh, and this is what we call our uh, ALS chip. Um, and so the flow was quite important. We had to develop some um, technologies for clearing for the immunocytochemistry. So we actually used clarity and a few other methods developed uh, at Stanford to, to get nice imaging. One example of ALS on a chip, this is the entire chip uh, image from a high level. And so we're quite uh, excited uh, to get these chips running and start looking at the physiology. And on that note, uh, we've been working with uh, a number of collaborators to look at uh, calcium imaging. And you can actually now calcium imaging these chips live. You can see the neurons firing here with calcium as they fire, they take out the calcium. And you can map which neurons are firing and over what time point. And the bottom left corner is building up a, a map of activity in this ALS chip. And now we can build these activities with things you can give drugs and see how it affects the activity. So you can start looking for phenotypes uh, that are specific to your disease. We've also been doing uh, a lot of omics. Uh, this is not quite ready for prime time yet. It's unpublished, but we're trying to reproduce these big data sets. It takes a lot of time, a lot of cultures. Uh, we had, in this case, five controls and five ALS samples. We made the chips and then we did our RNA and proteomics on the same chips. And we're starting to see clustering. Red is ALS, you can see with the PCA analysis, they are clustering at the top here and the controls are clustering at the bottom. So we can start separating ALS and control in these chips uh, based on uh, omics analysis. And now you actually have a nice assay where if you gave a drug, you might want to push the ALS cloud more into the control cloud. And uh, we're very excited to start doing those studies now. And this is a, again, a large group of uh, data that I'm showing you a snippet of as part of an ongoing uh, NIH grant. One of the challenges we've had is with bulk cultures is doing bulk RNA-seq. <clears throat> and we've been working very hard, especially with the fantastic postdoc I had uh, in my lab from UCLA called Richie Ho, who's now a faculty member here. And Richie and I just set out to try and see if we could do single cell RNA-seq on these complex cultures. And the long story short, if you want to go see a nice review of you know, how we dealt with a lot of the issues, this came out last year uh, in cell systems. But essentially, we can take a sample that looks like this, which is very complex. Uh, I look one of the motion neurons, and you can see they tend to cluster around these, these parts of the of this culture. There's not many down here. Uh, SMI32 is, a, is another kind of weaker motor neuron marker, and it's uh, you know, not as quite as intense as the uh, idol one, which is nucleus stain, and that piece in blue. So you can see these trends where there are no idol one cells, no motor neuron. So we're an analyzing all of that. So if one chip has more of one than the other in it, it's throwing your whole RNA-seq or proteomics analysis. And by doing single cell RNA-seq, we can basically bring it into focus and uh, 
now cluster all of those different cells. And this orange, in this case, the orange ones are the uh, motor neurons identified through specific markers that we uh, use to, to annotate these cultures. And we can actually now look at motor neurons separate from uh, there's different types of interneurons shown here, and you can then separate these from the astrocytes. And all of you are very familiar with single cell technology. Um, we've now actually, uh, I'm not going to show you the data because of time, but we've done, we've shifted gears now to single cell nuke uh, we found nuke seq to be much better for neural tissue. Uh, it turns out that you get quite a lot of variation when you do whole seq. And in fact, that cell systems paper, a lot of it was trying to do batch control across different lines and batches. Nuke seq is much more sta standard. It uh, gets rid of all the peripheral problems you have of how much of the axon do you capture um, when you do whole cell seq in complex neural tissue. And so and there's some nice papers on kidney. Uh, as well just coming out. The show NUCSEQ is actually giving you a, a tighter signal. And then the nice thing is you can compare it to in vivo because you can do NUCSEQ on any human tissue. And so we've switched now almost completely to NUCSEQ. Uh, I'll look at my next talk, I should be able to give you some nice uh, data on NUCSEQ detection of chip cultures from ALS. And those studies are currently uh, roaring along. Again, thank goodness. I have to say we were, a lot of these studies are quite large groups of cells, we were completely thrown by COVID and had to slow down. And now we're all up and running again with staff, but we're having trouble with supplies. So it's kind of, it's another frustration, can't get matrigel to save our lives, but I'm sure a lot of you are suffering from supply issues. Uh, so it's been a little frustrating, but we are making, uh, making headway. We have strong headwinds, but we're making headway. So I'll just uh, the switch gears into uh, Another very interesting area that we've been following is a few slides on PD, and I'm going to finish up uh, with COVID. Um, and Parkinson's disease, like ALS, uh, is a neurogenic disease. But here is a slower progression, and it involves the loss of dopamine neurons from the mesencephalon, this, this area down here, in the brainstem. And that leads to rigidity and lack of ability to move um, and a resting tremor. And it's interesting that. ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's, it's always about 10% of cases we know it's kind of the genes that cause it, and about 90% is sporadic. And that's the same with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we know some genes that cause it, but most of the time it's sporadic. Um, it's involving loss of dopamine, cells die in the Niagara, and the dopamine goes down, and that's what causes the symptoms. We decided to focus our efforts <clears throat> on young onset PD. It's a subset of Parkinson's. It's uh, rather distressing because you get it in, in your 40s uh, and usually you've got a full family going and it progresses reasonably fast. It's sometimes caused by genetics, uh, as shown here, this chunk are all genes that cause early onset. But 83% of early onset Parkinson's is also sporadic. No known genes that cause it. And so we ask the question, well, it's early onset. Maybe it's better to model with IPS cells using an early onset disease than a late onset given that they're, they're earlier in development and it's probably a stronger phenotype because it's arrived early and doesn't intersect with aging. I could give a whole talk on how aging modifies IPS-derived neurons, but to avoid having to deal with that, we thought we'd go with the youngest onset disease, just like we did with spinal muscular atrophy uh, for, uh, uh, for a motor neuron disease. <clears throat> can we make dopamine neurons? Well, Lawrence Studer showed many years ago, you can from both embryonic stem cells and IPS. It's a pretty standard protocol with dual SMAD inhibition and then ventralization to get to about 30 days. And you get these beautiful uh, tyrosine and hydroxylase dopamine positive neurons in the dish. When we first started, we just took three Parkinson's disease lines, early onset and three control. They all make dopamine neurons. We didn't see any significant difference uh, between across all the lines. There was one line that had a few less dopamine neurons, but on average, there wasn't an uh, overall difference so they can make dopamine neurons quite well. They uh, actually uh, release dopamine, and this was work with Nigel Maidman at UCLA, showing that they can uh, secrete dopamine for media. So what we were very surprised to find was that in the early onset PD lines have no genetic mutation. We did see a twofold increase in synuclein production. And so even though they had no synuclein mutation, deficits in synuclein, they were overexpressing synuclein. So there was something going on here. Um, very early in progression. This is, again, this is just an embryonic dopamine neuron, essentially. But it was showing high levels of synuclein protein, and synuclein is the kind of amyloid of Parkinson's. And so we knew that was bad. 
uh, but we were surprised that it came out with sporadic early onset cases. Um, this was only three lines. So of course, reviewers asked us for more lines. <clears throat> and the more we did, the we continued to see it. And this is just the numbers of differentiations and number, and then these are the different Parkinson's lines. Now there were two Parkinson's, so we never saw a control line have high levels of synuclein. They were always low, so you're okay if, if you don't have it. There's no, there's no uh, correlation with the Parkinson's, but we did see two Parkinson's cases that were actually borderline, so they didn't have very high, this is early onset. And we did see one case, this guy here, who had normal levels. It turned out this was an African-American, uh, and one of these was an African-American, and all the rest were Caucasian. We don't know what that means quite yet, but there's definitely uh, differences, uh, perhaps, um, across nationalities in terms of phenotypes. And clearly, even within these phenotypes, uh, the, there were different levels of synuclein expression. We're, we're exploring a lot more about the relationship between the synuclein and the uh, deficit. And, and this, uh, go see the paper. I don't have time to go right through it. It was published quite recently. Um, and this is work led by uh, Alex de Pearl, who was a postdoc in my lab, and now is a scientist in the lab. And essentially, uh, we saw this increase in synuclein. We determined in the paper was because it wasn't being degraded. So this is a lysosomal issue. Um, and then we found a drug called PEP that actually uh, is found in milkweed. Um, and it's one of these plant, uh, it's an ingol metubate uh, forbal ester, which uh, remarkably could reverse this uh, by activating the proteasome to act to actively degrade the synuclein. And so we've been working the company to produce this to maybe try and see if we can use it in the clinic. And unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Uh, it turned out this PEP005 uh, does uh, has some carcinogenic uh, features to it, which we didn't know at the time we were thinking about this, but just been um, shown in the company that was making it. So we're looking for analogs that can do the same thing, but don't uh, have the carcinogenic effect right now. So this really shows that you can determine Parkinson's early. Um, so that's obviously exciting. And, you know, having this model, we thought, well, maybe we could use the blood-brain barrier model to understand more about um, how we can deliver drugs <clears throat> and reverse this uh, deficit. So this brought out dopamine neurons from IPS cells. And as we showed, we can make IPS derived dopamine neurons. We can put them in the emulate chip uh, and uh, do the same thing as I showed you for ALS, but now we have what we call Parkinson's chip. And that's uh, shown here. Um, these chips do release uh, dopamine. And this is again in studies with Nigel Maidman, UCLA, measuring it with HPLC. And uh, we were quite excited about this data. We showed that the chip's quite reliable. And in fact, prior to COVID, if you'll remember, there was an opioid crisis uh, that is still here and it's now getting funded again, but we had a supplement with Nigel collaborating to look at opiates because you can activate these pathways with um, uh, these chips. These dopamine neuron chips actually have um, responses to opiates. So that's the reward mechanism in the brain is all to do with dopamine release. And so we've um, actually been working to study how, in this, in this particular proposal, how the opiate system works in these chips. And it's now been taken on in a collaborative uh, way where, uh, and, and I think Terasaki is involved with this, obviously, with Nigel Maidman, where they're now taking this to the next level and looking at their own chip designs uh, and looking at opiate effects uh, on dopamine neurons in these chip models. Um, and it's just some single cell from these chips which show they do have some of the opiate receptors um, and machinery required to stimulate uh, the opiate system. And they do in the early studies we've done, and this is now being done at UCLA and the Terasaki Institute, um, they do respond to morphine by releasing dopamine. These are very complicated studies, take a while to set up, um, but uh, just give some utility to, the, to these chips and how they could be used to understand addiction. So, Leading on from this, we, you know, it's a very exciting, um, obviously nice to know about opioid addiction and the use of these cells. The other aspect of Parkinson's is this uh, gut relationship. Um, very early before you get Parkinson's, you often will get uh, gut issues. Al almost 20 years before, you can have constipation and other gut issues that then later on you get the Parkinson's, there's a strong correlation. <clears throat> we really don't know the mechanism, but we do know that, um, this is from Michael Workman in my lab early on, we can make beautiful gut on a chip 
um, and published that some time ago. So you basically take the same IPS lines <laughs> that you made the brain cells from and made them into gut cells and put them on the chip and they model a lot of uh, gut processes. So this led to a crazy grant that Paul Allen requested. Uh, we write not NIH fundable. So we said, well, we'll do something exciting and we'll try and make IPS cells into both the brain chip that I've shown you and an intestine chip. And then with Susan, Suzanne Devokta here at UCLA, uh, at uh, Cedar sinai um, she's helping us with the gut microbiome, which we can seed onto the intestine chip, take the effluent and put it onto the brain chip and start asking questions about how the gut interacts with the brain and what might actually stimulate the brain to degenerate in Parkinson's based on uh, aspects of gut biology. <clears throat> There's a lot of interactions now. Um, Sarkasa uh, and others have shown this relationship between um, certain micro microbiome metabolites and short chain fatty acids and how they can affect uh, brain functioning. So this grant is actually gonna be connecting these two chips together and then have a, a real human model to understand this relationship between the gut and the brain and the microbiome. So it's very exciting. I don't have time to show you data from that, but Michael's working hard and uh, it'd be fun to give you an update. Maybe you can get Michael over to tell you about it. Really, uh, again, without going into a lot of other stories in the lab, <clears throat> I will highlight uh, Arun Sharma, who's uh, joined my lab a few years ago. Now has also just been made independent faculty at Cedars. And we reviewed the whole field. If you want to have a read and see where these technologies, including organoids are going, um, we tried to sort of cover a wide area in this review. Um, and I think it's said in the opening, we've got a lot of excitement from the community in terms of using these chips to predict uh, human disease. So we were roaring along and, you know, having nice front covers of National Geographic, it was great. The science was, was going great until this happened. Um, really threw a wrench in, in everything they were doing and had to stop and rethink and regather uh, as everybody else did. So I'm gonna finish up by just telling you some of the COVID work we've been doing. Um, and the first one was just published actually in Cell Reports. Um, and again, Arun uh, Sharma was in my lab and he worked on heart uh, tissue. And I think if you look on the right here, you can see these beating cardiomyocytes. So Arun is an amazing scientist. Uh, he jumped on the opportunity to collaborate with UCLA uh, and Vaiti Garaswamy actually used to be in, in the Institute of Cedar Sinai, moved to UCLA, and he is in the BSL-3 facility there. So he had COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 that we could add to the cultures. And early on in the, in the pandemic, <clears throat> they were worried about the effect of the virus on the heart, but we didn't really know if it could even infect heart cells. So Arun set up to answer that question and did so. Uh, he found that the heart cells become infected quite readily actually, much more readily than other tissues that he tried or we tried. Uh, and they affect the beating and the heart beating slowed down. And so this paper was quite nice and it went into the details of the mechanism and so forth. Um, he then got a grant from the American Heart Association to study this further um, and put the heart cells into the chip. So now you can see in this little video here, he's managed to get the heart cells into the chip and they will beat synchronously. If you look at the green cells there, the bottom, uh, beating uh, within the chip. And he's now looking at, very interesting, looking at antivirals to uh, prevent the infection. But in his own studies now, COVID is assessing, he's looking at modeling heart uh, toxicity using these uh, heart on the chip by flowing uh, drugs into the endothelial side and seeing how they interact with the beating cardiomyocytes. Uh, and this is very important for cancer where a lot of cancer drugs uh, have a side effect on the heart. Uh, and so he's trying to understand that interaction and do some predictive modeling of how these drugs might affect heart cells at the individual patient level. And this comes back to our core facility. We're able to make groups of IPS lines from patients with uh, cancer, then we can actually screen those for whether or not they might uh, be affected by a drug that's toxic to the heart. A lot of problems with toxicity is it's very much a small group of patients that uh, have the problem. And so we think these technologies will be able to screen drugs later on. And the final story for I end uh, is <clears throat> a collaboration that's spun out of one of our chip grants and uh, goes really back to the beginning story I told you with Don Ingber, where they had a lung chip. And we're very lucky to have Barry Stripp here, who's a world lung expert. And Barry's in our institute, been doing lung on a chip, and playing around a little bit, not too seriously, but once COVID came along, he got very excited. 
and we formed this nice collaboration. Michael Workman is leading this again from my lab, um, but Vitae at UCLA in the core there for the BSL-3. And Barry's group put together this uh, COVID grant um, with a company called Ionis, and some of you might know Ionis. It used to be called ISIS, and they changed the name for some reason. Um, and now they're Ionis, and they're one of the largest ASO companies uh, in the world. And they're producing antisense oligonucleotide technologies for treatment of various diseases. So the concept was, and I'm just one slide, I, again, I could give a whole talk on this, was what if we could make uh, ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides, against either ACE2, which is the receptor, as you all know, that's required for COVID to get into a cell, or more interestingly to me, <clears throat> we can make them against the actual viral messenger RNAs that are required to synthesize new virus within the cell. And so what we did is, first of all, get the lung chip going. This is actually a picture of uh, fluorospheres being put onto the ciliated um, uh, surface of the alveolar cells on the lung chip. And this is 3D reconstruction. So we made these chips. They have lung cells on them. And now we can do the infection. So you can put the COVID virus onto these chips. And then you can screen drugs. And we started screening HEX. Um, Ionis gave us 200 ASOs targeting various different parts of the virus uh, or the ACE2. Um, and we prioritize them in the screen. <clears throat> and down here is good. So this is viral infection. So we had five to 20% of the hex infected. And when we gave these two particular ASOs right at the bottom here, we've got nice inhibition of viral infection. So we know those ASOs are working and protecting the hex. <clears throat> we also know the ACE2 one that we picked um, out of this that had an effect was very efficient at reducing ACE, ACE2 levels in the cells. And then uh, this is very recent data. We've shown that the uh, RNA-seq, we can actually reduce uh, viral expression, particularly with this, this ASO uh, in our culture. So this is a mock with no uh, drug, and this is the uh, drug infection. Um, so it's preventing a viral load, which is normally quite high when you do an infection. And you give the SO and it knocks the viral load right down. So again, study in progress. Uh, we're doing a lot of work to uh, better understand this interaction. But the cool part of this is you can actually apply the ASO and the virus theoretically um, through a, um, uh, a small respirator. So you can just breathe it in uh, and that could be an ASO that then will go into the lung, distribute uh, and knock out the virus. So it's a new way of using ASOs to, to treat COVID. And the company actually has data um, already in cystic fibrosis using a ENAC targeting ASO to show that it can be used in the clinical trial. So all the pathways there to use this in the clinic, uh, we just need to build the ASO library, show that it's effective, which we have done, <clears throat> and then adapt that to them to a clinical trial. So I think this would be an alternative approach to, to patients who are coming into the hospital. Uh, potentially they could have basically uh, breathe in a, an inhaler, uh, take in the ASO, and that should neutralize the virus and, and it spreads very well throughout the lung tissue because ASOs are very permeable uh, and neutralize the virus. So exciting stuff. And again, this really came a combination of chip technology, ASOs and uh, having Barry Strip and, and collaborates with that. So I see it's 43 minutes, I will stop there. Uh, I thank everybody for their time and I hope left some time for, for questions. Uh, and this was a large number of collaborators who I've mentioned along the way uh, and, and many more I mentioned here that have either been in my lab and are still here or uh, across the institution. So I'll stop there Mehmet and, uh, and, and hand it back to you. Uh, well, thank you for this fantastic talk. Uh, unique cutting edge technology is quite, thank you so much. Uh, one question is, um, you've mentioned about multi-organs on a chip. Um, while making these, do you have questions about using the proper media? How do you make the proper media for multi-organs? Yeah, I mean, I think initially one of the goals <laughs> was to have, you know, five chips all linked together and pass the media from one chip to the next. Um, and that way, there are two ways you can do that. You could have the bottom could be the same, right, for blood. So you could have a blood media that you just pass through the bottom part of the chip. So that would be blood itself. And that would then go along the bottom of the, the, the chips. And then on the top on each chip, you'd have a different tissue. 
And if it was heart, you might have a different media to brain, to gut, to lungs. So you'd have two medias, one for the tissue and one, and then blood on its own on the bottom would be one way to do it. There is some leakage through the pores for the medias. So it's not, they're not contained exactly in, the, in each channel, but they're, the, the majority of the media would be in each channel. So that's, that's one idea. Thank you. Linking the, linking the chips has been a problem this quickly. One of the issues is air bubbles between them and so forth. So, so the other way is to actually just take the media off from each chip and then add it to the other one manually. Um, and that's another, another way to get the media between the different chips. All right. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about COVID and heart donor chip cardiomyocyte speaking. Uh, do you have a vasculature? I heard the, the COVID also affects the vasculature. Are these vascularized heart donor chip systems or not? So we have both. Yeah, we, we initially in the paper, we just put it on the heart on the heart beating cardiomyocytes to see if the question was whether they could be infected and they were. Now uh, Arun has the vascular side as well. And so the goal would be to see if you can, you know, get vascular infection. And I think there, there you're talking more about <clears throat> vasculitis kind of issues or stimulation of the vessels with COVID spike protein causing issues. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of modeling that could be done around that for sure. We're, we're just touching we're just, we have, we're not investigating that right now, but that would be one way to do it. Thank you. Another question. Have you done any work in uh, Alzheimer's? What would be the best approach to model and study Alzheimer's disease? So we have a project in Alzheimer's. Um, it's actually uh, frontotemporal dementia, which is a form of Alzheimer's because c 9 off causes either FTD, frontotemporal dementia, or uh, ALS, so that's kind of our linking in. And there we're just making cortical neurons from IPS, putting them on the chip and uh, putting the BMECs on the other side and modeling uh, the, the front temporal dementia. And we actually uh, got a big project going on that and trying to find out what phenotypes there are, et cetera. From the Alzheimer's side, we're not doing the kind of classic Alzheimer cases on a chip right now. I have. Uh, Alexander Moser in my lab, she's working with some of the APOE risk factors. So we have APOE 4, 4, 3, 4, and 3, and just comparing some of the biology of the APOE types, because we know that gives you a high risk for Alzheimer's. So those are some of the studies we're doing, and they're all in sort of mid stages right now. Uh, thank you. Another question came on Alzheimer's. Can the emulate chips uh, used for ALS or Parkinson's disease be used for uh, Alzheimer's disease research? And do they contain the same NVU cells? Yeah, so that's a, a lot of questions in there in a sense that we, this is something we discuss a lot, is the importance of isogenic NVU cells or the brain microvascular cells. So you, if you really want to model Alzheimer's, you probably want to use an isogenic line. So you have an Alzheimer line, you make the endothelial cells or the brain microvascular cells from the same IPS lines you make the cortical cells from. Uh, and that's totally possible. And uh, or you could have a whole batch of BMECs, brain microvascular cells that you use across many different Alzheimer's patients. So yes, uh, it's possible for Alzheimer's, you probably want to use, we're using cortical differentiation, which is uh, based on that different method by Xi et al in nature. So you, you can grow cortical neurons and put them on the chip and then use endothelial cells in the bottom, either isogenic from the same patient, or you can have a control line that you make the endos from. Then you're going to maybe miss some phenotypes because there might be some modulation by the endothelial cells that are helping the cells on top. Thank you. Another question came in um, about heart on a chip. What are the weaknesses of the current heart on a chip technology? Or I guess, how would you improve it if you have everything in your hand? The heart on the chip? Yes. Yeah. So well, one of the challenges in the fields, so ever since I was in Jane, you know, back in uh, Wisconsin, when they first started making beating cardiomyocytes, from embryonic stem cells is the maturity of the beta cardiomyocyte. And it, we're finding, and uh, Rudin can talk to this much better than I can, and, um, but he's finding that <clears throat> using the chip technology, I showed you a few slides from his work, you get more maturation. And so a lot of different channels are more mature. Um, and when you expose them to the endothelial cells, it seems like you get another level of maturation. So I think the advantage of the chip is more maturation of the cardiomyocytes in that, in that top channel through the, either the flow or the interaction with the epithelial cells. And I know the cardiac field is very interested in the maturation state of the cardiomyocyte to mimic what goes on in the human disease. 
a uh, question came about emulate chips. Uh, what are some challenges or deficiencies of using these chips? I'm sure they're useful, but are there any challenges in using or limitations? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think we all suffer, you know, substrate coating can be difficult. UV, you have to combine UV with coat, with, you know, substrate coating. They provide kits with everything in it. I have to say it's pretty reliable. Um, the thing that I really like most is the reliability of the PDMS chip itself. Uh, that seems to work really well. The downside is you can't modify it. So the pores of seven micron, you can't, like if I was with you guys, I could say, oh, make me a four micron pore because I don't want my cells to migrate. We, we can't get that from any late. So that's the downside is it's, you know, they are what they are. They have a few different versions, a slightly different top channel, say for the liver chip versus a brain chip, but they're pretty restricted. Now they're trying to open up different types of chip, but they're coming slowly. So, so the downside is you don't have the flexibility that you guys have when you engineer your own PDMS. And we, we have some guys that see us doing that. But the app side is more important, I think, is consistency. And the thing we battle with is consistently getting cells into the chip that work and reliably. And the cells is where all the variation comes from. Uh, the chips are pretty good right now. And I remember when I was in Wisconsin working with David Beebe and some of the engineers there, He'd always say, Clyde, the chip was perfect until you put cells in it. <laughs> like, well, isn't that the idea to put cells in it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, I like the consistency of the emulate system. At least you know your variations coming from your cells and whatever you're doing. But anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. A question came about the cell cell contacts in the blood brain models. To what extent does the porous membrane in the chip affect the chip models? and physiological recapitulation. Is there work being done trying to minimize the membrane or even completely remove it to improve cell-cell contact in barrier models? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, again, emulate are pretty fixed on this model. And I think where you're gonna get that is like uh, places like the Wiss Institute and Don Ingber who, who are constantly modifying and playing around with, with chip design. So yeah, you could make that thinner, definitely maybe help. I'll tell you, on the paper that we published, we actually saw what happened is the astrocyte end feet would stick through the seven micron hole, because we had astrocytes on the top channel in some of the models, and then they'd wrap themselves around the blood vessel below it, so that the endothelial cell below it. So that was quite neat. Um, but look, these things can always be improved on, and there's parasites that we didn't have in the model that you could put in. There's uh, the, the perivascular fibroblast there's, that sits in there as well, and there's lots of different things that we can do to enhance these models. One thing I'll say is the more cells you add, the more complicated the model gets and the more variation you get. So we end up fighting this like, we can't make two chips the same versus we get great function. So often you have to compromise somewhere. And I think reproducibility for the field is what's most important. Somebody else can take your model and reproduce it. And with the NIH chip consortium, they actually have a, some of you probably know, they have a central office where if you get something working, you can send it off and then show that it's reproducible an independent lab. And that's actually, I think, an important part of our technologies. So. Thank you. Another question came in. Thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if you considered metabolomics approach for biomarker discovery in organs on a chip. For instance, <laughs> COVID on a chip. If yes, if yes, what are the challenges? Yeah, very, very good question. And we just hired uh, Mark Sharpley from UCLA, who's a great metabolomics chap. And he's starting to really get into that. We've done some metabolomics. Very complicated. It's, uh, I never appreciated the complexity because, you know, things can be absorbed into the chip or taken out from it and released into it, into the media. Uh, so there's a lot of controls that you have to do with the metabolomics, but the answer is yes. I think it's the best assay because it's live and you can keep taking effluent off the chip and, and assay it and then do different things. So, so the answer is metabolomics could be fantastic um, and we're, we're doing a lot of that work. Thank you. Um, does the gut on a chip have self-renewal capacity? You know, they don't, uh, they don't proliferate a lot. They, they proliferate over the first, uh, so let me, I, I can back up a little bit. We actually start that process by making organoids, gut organoids in, in methacellular. So we make the gut organoids first, and then we sort them, uh, epicam sort, so that we just take out the epithelial cells, and then we seed them into the chip. So by the time they get to the chip, they don't proliferate too much more. Uh, we haven't done like DIVU staining for the crypt to see if the stem cells dividing, uh, but we don't think there are a lot of stem cells in there. 
Uh, but they do have all the other cells you'd expect in the crypts, PANF cells and other types of gut cells you'd expect to see. So I don't think there's a lot of division going on in these chips. And then they last about a month to two months. Um, you know, one of the goals for the field is to get longer and longer survival, right, within the chip so that you can do long-term studies. And they do wear off. I don't know if it's the PDMS interacting with the, they're lacking substrate or, but most of the chips last about a month at this point. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you for the fantastic uh, talk, uh, Clive. I appreciate your time. Oh, it's fantastic to be here and see you all kind of. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. All right, thanks.